Uh, so first of all, uh, Inner Space, we're a small production company, five uh, people, w was five people, moving to seven. Uh, we, you might know us because we're actually preloaded inside all the, all the Gear VRs. If you buy Gear VR, they give you a SD card with it, and we're on there. So probably a lot of you have already experienced uh, the fifth sleep in the cave, which are on there, and Playhead is on the uh, Oculus uh, store. So uh, I'm not going to be talking so much about what we've done. Uh, we uh, are... Uh, artistically, narratively, culturally driven, and we basically want to make uh, content that draws a lot of emotion from you. A lot of people have talked about that. I'm going to skim over that, too. Uh, but I am going to give you a little story. So initially, we were nobodies doing not really a lot. Uh, as far as uh, February of last year, we were just five people working with basically no money, not really doing that much. And uh, we were making small uh, 3D videos. And then we decided to go to Korea on partially for business and partially for uh, vacation. And over there, we met Oculus. Most people don't even know that Oculus have offices in Korea, but one of the co-founders is from there. So they, have a, they opened up shop over there, and it serves as the bridging, bridging relation between them and Samsung. And so we were introduced uh, to Inner Space by a random connection, and they loved what we did. They thought that it was particularly great directing even though our, it was 3D and the graphics were uh, probably already a year old at this point. Uh, and it was on DK1, so it really didn't give it good visual representation. But they still really liked the directing and the way we approached, uh, the, we approached uh, VR directing. And so they introduced us to Samsung, who themselves loved what we did, and they kind of really pushed us towards going mobile. And w at the time, we were with the DK1, and we really didn't, weren't very excited about mobile about, because we were doing 3D and you know, real-time rendering on mobile. You don't have the same processing power. And that seemed like a really big limitation. But pretty quickly, we got wooed. We got uh, seduced by what Samsung was telling us, which was the, the future is mobile VR. The future is you're going to have so much, more, so, much, so much more people doing mobile VR than normal uh, Oculus based on PC just because everybody has a cell phone. And in a way, it's true. In a way, it's not true. It's an argument that doesn't need to be made here. But we were convinced by it after some time and some money. And uh, we started working on it. And pretty quickly, they gave us their early lights well, on there. It's probably one of the top three up there. We, they, they gave us that. And we realized that like it was really, really good if we just took our 3D uh, real-time renderings and film them with virtual cameras and we could make actually like really awesome video very quickly and the latency was great and it was so easy to demo we didn't need to have a computer and we would just go to offices to show it to people and it just made the entire experience just that much more painless so the experience was easier on the software side, but it was also easier on the hardware side. The fact that we didn't have to explain anything to anybody, the fact that we didn't have to say like, oh, sit down here and just don't worry about the cable and just like, we just put it on people made a huge, huge difference. And not having controllers, not having any learning curve meant that we quickly got ad like addicted to the ease of use and we just could never come back to that DK1 and whenever we tried to show it on DK1, first of all the screen made it cringe because we went from DK1 to 1440p and that was just, you know, I mean, uh, if, you, if you haven't tried a Note 4 screen or a Gear VR, try it just for the difference because it's really a, l a lot better than even the DK2. And it makes a, a huge difference on the experience. Uh, when you're talking something that's a very visual uh, experience, that, that makes a huge difference. So everything that I've said so far also applies to live action movies, which a lot of people have already talked about today. So why not do live action mobile experiences? Well, also er uh, hit on by earlier people, there's really not very good 360 cameras. There's one right there that does the trick and works, but the fact that you need to have tiny cameras, shove them in a way so that they fit perfectly and they cost a lot is a big barrier to entry for amateur filmmakers. It's just not easy to raise the thousand or two thousand or three thousand dollars that the basic camera is going to give you. Then the stitching might be complicated and there's just a lot of restriction to it. If you try live action movies, most of the time you have to, you can't move. The camera's fixed and there's no locomotion. If you have a locomotion, you need either tracks or people to move it, then you have to hide that. It's very complicated. And 
people do it. I mean, Jaunt VR and so many other, co many other companies are doing it. If you try the live action movies on the Samsung Gear VR, they have uh, hooked on a helicopter or on a boat or stuff like that. And it works, but it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit of an object to immersion, as in you, you can't hide all of the filmmaking aspects. Whereas in 3D, you really control the environment. And you know, the way we did it, we made this uh, we were actually on CryEngine, which was a huge pain, but for VR it's a pain, but we are moving to Unreal, uh, which is way better. Love Unity as well, we built on that too. But uh, we basically made 20 virtual cameras that shot 60 screenshots a second in every direction. And you know, like 20 cameras on a rig like this would take a huge amount of space. I think this one is how many, like eight or 10 cameras at tops? Six, seven, six, was that six? I can't count. Um, yeah, so the seven cameras, and they're small and that works, but you could get a better quality if you had 20 cameras, but then it would be a huge ball, and then you have a problem with like proximity to the camera, and there's a ton of hardware restrictions. And finally, the last reason why I'm, I'm pushing more for people to create movies in 3D is because reality is limiting. Reality is not as far as the imag imagination can take you. And a lot of what, if you're doing reporting, if you're doing trying to bring real life into a 360 environment, obviously there's no argument. But I feel like so much content today is not related to reality. So much content is trying to expand what reality is. And virtual reality is this, I mean, I want to steal that from Palmer, but this rift into another world. So, well, that's, uh, that's a pretty easy uh, question and answer. Well, not use a CG rendering software that's extremely expensive. Well, it's because it's extremely expensive. That takes a lot of time. And the argument I'm making here is that if you're an amateur filmmaker, 3D live rendering is a lot easier to approach because you don't need to have this ex expensive hardware. You don't have all those limitations, but you don't also have to use this crazy long process and expensive process of making you know, DreamWorks movie. I am making the argument that you should be using Unreal Engine to make small movies and to explore your inner director, your inner uh, filmmaker. Yeah, and uh, that's pretty much uh, just the small argument I came up here to do. Uh, if you want, uh, I'm, I'm just going to pop a little video to just uh, give you a hint of what we're working on and what we've worked on and what you'll never see again. But.
way too intense to compared to what we actually do. It's a lot more mild and easy to go through. But anyway, uh, this, that was pretty much it. I'm just going to do some uh, closing remarks. Uh, I don't know if you've heard, but Interspace was accepted part of the River Program, which is an accelerator in San Francisco. Uh, I'm doing them a little a bit of advertisement because they're just they're great people. And uh, yeah, I'm actually don't work with them anymore, but I love them and have a great relationship with them. Uh, I just want to do one second of self-promotion, which is uh, I'm actually, I opened my own sports broadcasting application. I heard some people ask some question about sport broadcasting earlier, so I'm uh, asking you to come and uh, see what I've got. And I have my Gear VR, and if you want to try some inner space experiences, you're welcome to come see me, or otherwise anybody who has a Gear VR, because they have our experience. So, yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> Guys, thanks so much. We haven't escaped the stage yet. You made, uh, you were brilliantly succinct and have helped us get a bit more on time. So that's really appreciated. We will squeeze in just a couple of questions. So, chap, all second row from front. Uh, that would be fantastic. Um, your sports broadcasting thing is it 360 VR? Come talk to me about it afterwards. I, as much as I want to, I don't want to steal Inner Space of Thunder too much. Uh. But yes, it is. <laughs> no, it's not 360. But yes. <laughs> Cool. And anybody else? We can squeeze in one more question. Um, oh, there's a hat. The chap standing up at the back. Oh, so, oh yeah, the chap standing up at the back. You Sorry. Too. Come on. Um, uh, excellent work, by the way. I absolutely love your films. So amazing. Um, resolutions. You're, it actually looks fantastic in the gear. Um, but I noticed, because I've sort of sneakily looked at the file, it's 30 frames a second. And... Uh, square is square in the thing. Could you just talk about? Uh, we were forced, bullied, whatever you want to call it, into downgrading the resolution because you know our files. Uh, you know, making movies in 360 is makes really huge files, and uh, and yeah, we had to downgrade the the quality of it. Is, that's your question, right? I'm answering that, right? It, it depends a lot of the visual aesthetics that you're trying to go for. If you can lower the resolution, make it more swallowable to people so they can actually experience it with a lower, smaller file, it's, it's, it's very context sensitive. And I, I, don't, I don't personally have a recommendation. And in fact, I don't even remember what the one on Gear VR ha is because I have like a, a special HD one because I'm privileged. <laughs> Nice one. And we will just let this chap, as his hand is up so eagerly, uh, squeeze in a really quick one, um, and then we will have to go on to the next speaker. Um, you mentioned development environments. You said CryEngine, Unity, Unreal. Yeah. Could you tell us anything about where you see strengths and weaknesses and what worked for you? Uh, well, the, OK, the things about, I mean, Unity and Epic have both given VR people like a lot of support. Uh, we have no hate on the CryEngine engine itself like it was great for the graphics that we wanted and everything and it gave us something that was great but uh, they've been just you know lagging behind as far as VR support goes so we had to build our own VR solutions all over the place and that worked but it was imperfect and it was not helpful in the time that we had to bring it to the project moonlight which was the name of the gear VR before it was the gear VR there's actually, uh, it's a good opportunity for me to segue and talk about the track out the back at lunchtime Andy Bramwell from Unity is doing and it talk through there about implementing VR in Unity. So that might be useful to people pondering that kind of question. But thanks so much, Andre. Brilliant Thank talk. You. Cheers.